So good morning, everybody, uh, once more to the last session of the school. And we will talk today about creating parameters from uh, DFTV, uh, for the DFTV method. Uh, you see my sleeves are here wrapped up. So that means this is, this is a hard topic. But it's not that bad, then you will, you will fear maybe at the uh, uh, beginning. I would like to show you a little bit about the theory behind that. So basically, why do we need parameters? We have talked about uh, already in the, in the um, uh, second day on, on Tuesday when I was presenting the theory of the FTB. And now I would like to just, just remind you of a few things uh, which, which we covered then and then basically discuss about what does it mean, uh, what kind of consequences it has for the parameterization, right? And then uh, following that, we would have a hands-on session. Uh, basically, the structure will be such that we will have three different talks uh, today and three different hands-on sessions. First, I will talk about the electronic part a little bit. Then Yola will tell us about repository fitting with two-body terms. And then Nir will tell you about uh, repository chimes uh, for split corrections where you can also use three-body terms. So basically, at the end, you should have the full picture and uh, more or less the full capability you can uh, have in order to fit parameters for the DFTB method. So just to come back to this slide, uh, just to remind you, we have three, if, if you are talking about second order DFTB, we have uh, three different terms which we have to cover, the band structure term, a repulsive term, and the second order term. And just to remind you, again, we have basically, uh, the uh, we have the strategy in DFTB that the band structure term and a second order term are cal calculated explicitly with certain kind of approximations. And the repulsive is fitted uh, to uh, uh, in an empirical way or a semi-empirical way. And um, yes, uh, also just to remind you, we need uh, a kind of uh, reference density uh, in order to calculate those terms, uh, which we, and this is something we will see later more in detail, I already told you it's a sum of compressed atomic densities, right? So this is basically where we are starting from. Now, let's start with the repository because it's not my part, so I can do it very quickly. Uh, uh, but just to remind you, we have told you that usually in DFTB, you are writing the repository as a sum of uh, two body terms. And uh, just to remind you, again, these two body terms are basically functions, functions which are depending on the species type. So for every species type, you have a different function, a di different so called repository potential. And this function is a function of distance, right? So basically, if I know who carbon, uh, what, what is the correction from carbon or carbon for different distances, then basically I can create the carbon-carbon repulsive. The same in this molecule, I would have to create the carbon-hydrogen uh, repulsive function as a, as a function of distance and the hydrogen-hydrogen. And we are talking about two center interactions, so two atoms interacting with, with, with each other. So you could say, okay, this is super easy. I'm just take a dimer. I am just stretching this dimer and calculating the, uh, the, the ab initio energy for this dimer. I would calculate the DFTB energy for this dimer uh, um, with all the repulsive. So I would calculate the band structure term, the second order term, and uh, maybe the spin polarization term, whatever it's, it's, uh, this dimer needs to, uh, needs to have. And then I could just subtract the two energies from each other. And then basically, I would immediately have the repulsive for those two, uh, uh, for the interaction of those two atoms, right? Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends how you see it, it's not that easy, right? So that this, this you can indeed do, and, uh, and it turns out that the repulsive you get is not, not very nice because those atoms are not embedded into a real chemical environment, and therefore, basically, they behave completely differently as if they would be part of, the, of this molecule here. And this is why you will see strategies later in the second and the third talk, how you can take also the environmental into account and create a repository, which are, uh, which are of course, then transferable between different systems and dif different molecules or different solids. Okay. Now let's have a look on the electronic parameters. So we are talking now about the H0. So basically we are talking about the band structure term uh, here. And basically just to remind you, we have to calculate those kind of two center integrals, right? So we, 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 we were discussing that in the on-site loss, we are just taking the, we are just taking the uh, eigenvalue of the free isolated atom which is super easy. You just make a DFT calculation of the atom and you are just taking those values from there. But then we have the so-called two-center integrals. These two-center integrals is the one which we have to calculate and we have to tabulate them as a, as a function of distance. Because we discussed if you have, let's say, a, uh, two p orbitals, 
it doesn't matter who they are oriented, you can always decompose their interaction into a combination of a PP sigma and a PP pi interaction. So basically, if we are tabulating PP sigma and PP pi as a function of distance, so the Hamiltonian for PP sigma and PP pi, so just uh, imagine the one, the phi mu, R, a, a phi, phi mu a is just the p orbital on atom a in the origin, and phi mu b is just the p orbital on the, uh, in a certain distance from the origin on atom b. And then we can calculate the sigma pp uh, sigma interaction for various distances and the pp pi interaction for various distances. And this is what we tabulate. And when we tabulate it during the calculation, we don't have to make any integrations anymore. We are super fast and very happy. Now the question is, OK, how do we do that, right? And um, there are two ingredients here, as you can see. It's the wave function, which I used to sandwich this thingy in the middle. And this thing in the middle contains the kinetic energy and the effective potential. And the effective potential depends if you are doing density superposition. And I would suggest to basically always do density superposition. You could be tempted to use potential superposition. Then your band structure are looking better. But believe me, on the long term, you are better with density uh, compression. So we have made the experience that uh, if you also want to have energetics, and that's usually what you want, then you can fit better repulsives to your systems if you are generating the band structure time with density superposition. And therefore, I here I'm only showing density superposition. <laughs> Why is it density superposition? Because we have to add up the two densities and then calculate the effective potential of that instead of uh, adding up the effective potential of the electrons. So we have two ingredients, the, the basis functions, which are uh, outside, and the two densities, which are inside. And uh, those ingredients are the one which we can use in order to tune, optimize, uh, call it however you like, uh, the behavior of the FTB, how it calculates, uh, how it calculates the integrals and uh, how good it is. We could theoretically use for, phi, uh, for the basis functions and also for the densities, densities of free atoms, right? Uh, but as it turns out, that's not very good. If you think about the hydrogen molecule, uh, if you put together two hydrogen molecules, if, if, you, were to, if you would just add, add up the atomic densities, then you would have almost uh, no electrons in the middle or just very few. And then those hydrogens wouldn't like each other, right? I mean, uh, atom cores are usually tend to repel each other. And therefore, you need to pack electrons in the middle in order to make sure that they are not repelling each other, right? So that they are, they have, there's a chemical bond. No, we don't have that, that, that many methods to do. But we can compress the densities, and then to make sure that if I adding the compressed density on the two atoms, then in the middle I will have enough electrons so that the chemical bond happens. And this is why we are compressing the densities and the wave functions when we are calculating those integrals. You can immediately see what is the what is the uh, what is one of the consequences is that on the outside of the hydrogen molecule you will have a density which decays very fast, faster than it would in a ab initio method. And this is something also you have to be careful. For example, when you have layered materials and you are to, uh, calculating the interaction of two different layers, because we are using compressed orbitals in order to describe the covalent bonds in the layer, and they are usually beautiful. But then the interaction between the layers, because your basis functions are compressed, they will vanish faster than it would faster in a initio method, right? So this is something you would always keep in mind. We have compressed orbitals to describe the, uh, the, 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 the short bonds, the normal bonds, uh, accurate enough, and that could be that if you have a very, very long bond, it may be not that accurate, right? So that is something you should not forget. Now, how we can compress? There are several ways you can compress. In the DFTB method, uh, there are also various approaches, but the most common is that we are compressing by putting the atom in a confinement potential, which is just a power function, right? This is the term here. You can see. We are just solving the free isolated atom plus a confinement potential, right? And if you put this atom in the confinement potential, then the wave functions which you get will be automatically confined. I mean, this is a potential which goes to infinity if you go to infinity. So the wave function will be not that uh, comfortable and just expanding into infinity and decaying slowly. No, you are compressing it. It will decay much faster. And uh, basically, the parameter you can choose is uh, uh, how, you, uh, how you compress it. That means which power of the function you take and uh, what is the compression, uh, compression radii, right? So if you have R over RA, 
RA would be the compression radii for atom A, and N is the parameter of the compression potential. This parameter very often people set to two or four. Some people even optimize it. I'm not sure whether that, that is, uh, gives you uh, so much leverage, but basically this is one parameter. And the even more important parameter which we will treat today is this compression radius. So basically for every species, you can set it uh, independently. And the good thing is it's species dependent. It's not species pair dependent as a repulsive. It's just species dependent. So you decide it for carbon, for hydrogen in the seed for a system, which we have seen before. And then you generate all the, all the integrals between carbon, 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 hydrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen. Okay. Now we have densities and we have wave functions. And it turned out when people changed to the density, uh, density uh, superposition scheme, that for some reasons, it's better if you compress this density, which goes in here differently. So de you derive it from an atom with a different compression as the wave function. And also here for the atom, the density for atom B can be compressed differently than the wave function. And this is exactly what uh, uh, you, we usually do. So basically we have a so-called density compression which gives you, how do you compress the atom from, from which you are deriving the density uh, N0 in the potential. And we are making an other atomic calculation with a different compression radii where you derive the wave functions, right? So th those things. So we have the density compression and the wave function compression. And fortunately or unfortunately, uh, people tend, and sometimes it's really necessary, uh, tend to use different compressions for the different uh, angular momenta when we calculate the wave functions, right? So basically, you very often see in the FTB parametrization that the wave function compression for the S and the P shell was different. Typically, if you have an unoccupied shell, like in a silicon or D shell, you would tend to compress it differently because, uh, because it, behaves, uh, it behaves them better. And basically, that's everything. So... We could finish here. You just have to do those, let's say, two parameters, or, or, uh, or if, if you are uh, for silicon with SPD, you were optimizing the shares differently, then you would have the three parameters, one for the S, one for the P, one for the D, and one parameter for the density compression. So four parameters, and then you now you start to optimize. But how do you know what is a good value? And of course, what we want to describe here is the quantum mechanics. Right? So you should not forget, whatever you do here, it will determine how, how, how good your quantum, mechanic des, uh, quantum mechanical des description in the FTB is, because that's the only quantum mechanical term apart of the charge transfer, but for the charge transfer, you don't have any free parameters. So what is a, what is a typical thing to, do, to look at if you have this thing and you don't have repulsive yet? If I don't have repulsive, I don't have total, total energies yet, so I cannot relax. So I cannot ask myself, what is the final geometry of this thing? Or uh, what is the energy of, uh, the, uh, between different configurations? The only thing I have access to is something which is an electronic property. So I have access to charges on atoms and the band structure. And therefore the sanity check here, as we will see in the hands-on, is having a look at the band structure, okay? And please don't be tempted just to optimize blindly and hope that the band structure will be roughly okay and using just total energy as your loss function and putting everything together and hoping for the best. To my experience, it never works. So usually you should have a more or less uh, proper band structure. And if your band structure is not proper, then you may at the end, when you also fit the repair, if I have the right energies, but you will have them for the wrong reasons because you messed up the quantum mechanical part. So basically, when you start to torture your molecule and making your reactions, it will not do the right thing. So this is a very, very important part. And uh, this is which you have to uh, do very careful. Um, so how can you do that? So basically, we will have uh, three different steps we have to do. We will just make a, a free atom calculation in order to get the on-site energies, which we discussed that we are using the on-site energies, and we discussed that uh, if you want to describe the charge transfer, which you always want, usually, we would like to, uh, there you use the chemical hardness of the atoms, right, of the free atoms. So basically, we are making a free atom calculation where we derive the uh, on-site energies and the chemical hardness from it. Then we compress the atom in one way, and from that calculation, we are again solving the at atomic DFT problems. So it's a pure DFT calculation, absolute as a initial as you can think about that with an uh, additional confinement potential. And then we are deriving the density. 
And uh, then we are making a third calculation and where we are compressing our atom again differently. And from that, we are deriving the wave functions. So we need three calculations, free, uh, uh, free atom, density compression, wave function compression. And then we are assembling this so-called SK table. Here you see what you have to change and, and, and choose. For the one center calculation, the free atomic calculations, I have to, uh, which I talked so far, I, I have to choose the basis. We have stator type orbitals. Uh, so you, you, can, you can choose who, which basis you use, but that's usually it's an easy process. And we have to choose each time for a two compressed calculation, the confinement potential. When I have this, I have the wave functions and the densities. And then, no, the only thing I have to do is calculate these integrals here, right? Uh, these integrals here for different distances between the center A and B. And this is the so-called second, uh, this is the so-called two-center calculation, which is done by the SK two-cent program. And the one-center calculation is done by a code which is called Slater Atom. So those are all part of the SK prox suite, which, uh, which you use today, and which you can also download uh, from, from GitHub. And if you make the two-center calculation, then we have to decide uh, on, on uh, two relevant things. Uh, which kind of superposition you use, but I will assume that uh, we will use density superposition. And if you, if you use density superposition, you have to calculate the effective potential. But if you are calculate the effective potential, you have to decide on the functional. But the functional is the same as, should be the same as you use in the atomic calculation. And this can be LDA. We usually don't do that. This can be GGA, so PBE. That's the most common. But uh, as you heard already in various talks from Thomas, for example, we have the range separated functions. Then you would do the atomic calculations, range separated, and also the two center calculation when you calculate the exchange correlation potential for the sum of the two densities, you would also use the range separated potential there, uh, range separated function there. And then you need an integration grid. And uh, so basically, that's just a technical parameter. And then you have to set up, okay, for how many distances you want to calculate these integrals. And then in a DFTB calculation, we would, of course, interpolate uh, between uh, those distances. And then at the end, we are just, uh, we are just setting up uh, the SK tables. And there, there is an option that adding a so-called dummy repository, which is but just a zero in order to make sure that the FTB uh, plus can read it in and work with that repository. And here you see the programs which are handling that. As I already said, the two low-level programs as later atom and SK2 cent. Believe me, you never ever want to, want to have to do with these programs directly. They are, they are, the input is... Uh, it's not that nice, it's okay, it's okay, but it's not that nice to use. And therefore there is a script skgen, which drives the two programs. And you will have to do with the skgen. You only have to look into the input and output of those two programs if something goes wrong, which sometimes happens, <laughs> but not that often. Um, and so there is this skgen and with that, obviously we see you can already generate uh, SK tables. And then we have one tool, there are also others uh, out in the wide. Uh, we have one tool called SKPAR, which is even able to drive SKGen and make a particle swarm optimization. So basically, you can say, this is my band structure. This is what I would like to have. And please try to exchange the parameters, which I treat as free parameters, as long as the band structure you get is not close enough to the one which I take. OK. And basically, with that, I also want to finish the technical part, because we will just do everything covering the hands on. The only thing I wanted to show very, very briefly what you can achieve at the end, and this is a parametrization which was done in 2015 or 2014 actually by uh, Arnold Fichy uh, and uh, us. And this is basically just for gold. And I just want to show you what you can achieve uh, with, with parametrization. So basically here, for example, you see that this is the band structure for different phases of the gold. And, and gold is not trivial to parameterize. So I didn't choose um, some very easy, okay, it's carbon, carbon or something system, it's gold. It's not that trivial to parameterize, but you can get a very good achievement basically around the Fermi level between DFTB and DFT, right? And uh, basically by fitting repulsive, which we even got the different phases of gold, the order of the different phases of gold, right? A part of one, uh, one small difference in the, in the order and, and even the differences in the formation energies are comparable. And uh, I'm just putting in a slide so that later you can look at that. You can also roughly guess what are, what are the expectations. So please don't expect that you get the effective mass with a, uh, with, uh, with a precision of two digits, right? So, I mean, this is an approximate method. So you, you, you get usually quite nice results, but of course you will never uh, get a initio. Uh, and uh, here 
Um, I, I won't go through the table, but you can uh, we are here analyze whether the cluster formation energies, once we had the electronic and the repulsive parameters, how good they are. You can, for example, compare partial density of states, and they should also match roughly the uh, ab initio counterpart. So basically, you should make sure that in the electronic part, you are disguising the quantum mechanics correctly. And then if you want, I mean, Arno was very, very, uh, very, very detailed. You can also look on the HOMO and LUMO. You have learned how to visualize them. You can look whether they are representing the same states because you definitely want to do that. If you do something uh, basically at the Fermi level, at the HOMO or a LUMO, you have a reaction that you have the right states which are involved. And that you also can check. And if you did your parametrization correctly, they should match between DFTB and DFT. And um, uh, you can also look on different configurations if you have the repulsive. I mean, uh, Yola and Nir will talk about more. And here, for example, we just had a look on, on different on, on the different uh, reaction path. If you move things on the surface, and then you can compare it against ab initio. And if you are lucky and you did your work right, you should get roughly similar results. Okay, with that, I would also like to finish uh, the, just talking here and showing you claiming things. And uh, I would suggest let's just do it ourselves and then you can see how far you can come. Thank you.